Okay. So the, the first thing I wanted to start with, um, with you guys today, is about the journal itself and the background and kind of the aims of it. Right. Hmm. Well, basically the journal was started um, four years ago now almost, um, off a laptop in my two bedroom unit at Cooper. Um, and I guess the, uh, the basic uh, idea was that um, Australia lacked an open forum where people from all sides of a political point of view could come and express themselves. So that's where we started off. Uh, we started using opinion pieces uh, because we didn't have to pay for them, uh, because they're accessible to people, um, and because we could find people who could write those and we could to write them for our site. And so what type of issues do you address in the journal? Well, a lot of it's driven out of the sorts of things that interest me. So we're dealing with the economy, we're dealing with social issues, uh, we deal with issues like the Republic on a, a pretty regular basis, we look at governance issues, uh, we try and uh, look at uh, scientific and environmental issues, uh, particularly as we think the uh, mainstream press don't cover them particularly well. Uh, we've uh, also uh, looked at uh, uh, doing research type stuff, focus groups and so on, uh, through the site, uh, because we don't think that there's enough in-depth research done by newspapers and uh, magazines into what's really going on in people's heads. Uh, we're struggling, uh, but we're trying to produce uh, a bit more content on Aboriginal issues as well. Mm -hmm. And is there any kind of issues or topics that you wouldn't cover in the journal? Um, oh yeah, Princess Di, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, Tess and Gage to Who. We have some sort of threshold positions. We aim to be a, a journal that's uh, uh, producing conversational or sense type material, but one that's also recognised as having quality. So we just don't publish anything. We don't just publish on any particular uh, field. We don't have the crime can publish and be sued uh, type financial model. Um, we uh, like to have things up there that uh, have been checked out and uh, aren't particularly sensational. Mm -hmm. So, can you tell me about your, the readership of the journal? Um, yeah, we can only guess at it in some respects. I mean, you're obviously a, a reader, uh, and uh, there's a number of academics that we know that read the, the journal. If we have anybody email. watching this video. Be Everybody reader. watching this video. <laughs> right, yeah. uh, we've got uh, about 2,100 people on an email list. We know there's a lot of EDU uh, extensions on the uh, uh, email addresses. We know there's a lot of Hotmail, we assume that a lot of those are students. However, in the Hotmail uh, group you often uh, get people with uh, Arabic and uh, Asian sounding names and uh, given that we get a fair bit of traffic between uh, uh, midnight and uh, uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, we think we've got a reasonable international readership and there are actually people overseas in countries that don't get a lot of information and international affairs using us for that sort of uh, material. Uh, we've got a lot of bureaucrats, policy makers, a lot of dot govs. Uh, in that, uh, there's a lot of students, uh, university and secondary school, journos, you know, the ABC, for example, are on the site. Last month I checked, it was about an average of three times a day from what we could pick up. Mm -hmm. uh, people like me who have just got a general interest in current affairs. Yep. And what would you say the size of the readership is then? What's our circulation? Um, don't know. We get 45,000 unique uh, visits roughly each month. Uh, which translates into 90,000 page views. Now, how many individual people they are, I'm not sure. It might be, you know, you might have to divide that by uh, 28 because it might be the same people every day having a look at the site. I don't think so. Uh, so maybe there's half of that, or maybe it's two thirds of that. Not really sure, but um, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about um, policy makers and academics and people from the ABC looking at the site. Mm. Um, does, uh, do you have any comment on how the site interacts with, say, the mainstream press or policy makers? Do you have any indication that these articles are read in the corridors of power or influence the, what's on the TV in any particular evening? Yeah, we're, I mean, we're conscious that we're only one way of getting information out. So we go out of our way to try and get a bit of cross-promotion. Um, for example, in Brisbane, I'm reasonably well known as a commentator on ABC at radio and sometimes on TV. Uh, the Courier Mail's picked up material that we've, we've written. Uh, we've been quoted in some of the other journals around the place. And, um, 
and in Parliament, yeah. Uh, I mean, you mentioned that um, an article that you wrote, Chris, has resulted in you being approached by journalists. So, yeah, we, we know that, that there's uh, to and fro going. It's something that we actually consciously try and uh, push along because we're trying to get a larger readership for the journal. Uh, and really, more people read offline than read online. So, for us, that's an important part of promoting the site. Okay. So, moving to kind of discussion about the content of the site. What is it that you look for uh, in the articles that you accept for publication? Um, well, we've got a few criteria. Um, I mean, basically, there's two sorts of people to get in. One is people who've already got some sort of a standing in the public debate. Um, so, you know, if you're the Prime Minister or if you're the Leader of the Opposition or if you run some sort of uh, political action uh, group, uh, pensions and superannuants league, say, for example, then you, you'll get a Guernsey. Uh, and we'll have a very light touch on what you write. So if you're making a fool of yourself, that's your problem because you bring some credibility to the journal. The other sort of people who get published are people who don't have public standing, who are in some cases making a name or in other cases have some sort of a name but, but have it as writers or, or something of that nature. And we're a lot tougher in terms of looking at that material because they're borrowing our credibility to a certain extent. But if you can write well and you have a reasonable case, and you know what you're talking about, then you're the sort of person that, that we want to talk to. Uh, part of what we're trying to do is to bring expert opinion uh, close to the public without the intermediation of journalists who tend to be generalists and often mangle what it is that they're trying to, uh, to get across. Mm -hmm. So can I ask then, um, policy is kind of a notoriously complex uh, issue in general terms. As as you've kind of intimated already, how do um, how would you advise writers to handle the complexity of issues in their opinion piece writing, maintain the richness of what they're talking about, but still manage to have a persuasive opinion piece? Well, what they've got to try and do is personalise. They've got to make what they're saying relevant to people, which means they really have to find some sort of analogy or common experience that they can share with the reader and use that to demonstrate what they're talking about. Um, now that doesn't mean that they have to oversimplify and talk down to the reader, but it does mean that they've got to find a fair amount of, of ground that's common, that they can then edge the reader out of their comfort zone and give them new information. But if there isn't that common ground, if they can't find something which meshes for both of them, then the piece is going to be impenetrable and inaccessible and it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. But you also have to be very very um, economical with words. There's no point waffling. There's no point trying to appear more important or trying to make grand points. Get straight to the point um, and make it as clearly and as unambiguously as you can. Yeah. That's, you know, that's probably probably the, the thing that we encounter most is people who um, have a very good point to make, but they make it in a roundabout or a clumsy way. And that means then you don't have room in the article to account for complexity and to acknowledge this is a limitation of this argument, this is the other side of the story and things like that. So you must be very economical. Mm -hmm. What about yeah. the use of facts and figures and statistics and like? Um, sparingly. Um, the sort of readership we've got I don't think is interested in long tables of figures. They want someone to excerpt out some of the more interesting bits and pieces and use it to illustrate a point. What we can do being a web-based pu uh, publication is we can actually have those facts and figures as a separate HTML page so that if someone does want to go and have a look, they can click on a link and go across it and have a look. But for the general reader, we don't want them being distracted with a whole lot of uh, statistics because statistics is one of the things that people find very difficult to deal with. They're abstract and most people are concrete. Mm -hmm. You can always link to an original report that does have all of the figures in a different context, yeah, particularly if, it's, if they're ABS figures or if they're OECD figures, or if they're UN figures, all that stuff's on the web. All we do is say, these are the, get the writer to take out the most important piece. Give us the so what about that important piece. And if you want to know the rest, dear reader, here's the whole report. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when you're talking about people who've got an academic background or academic bent, the sort of common problem that they have writing uh, is that academic writing tends to uh, have a uh, pretension, if you like, of uh, uh, being impartial. 
uh, it tends to use words which are specific to the particular area of study. Uh, and it tends to use techniques like the passive voice rather than the active voice. Uh, so what you need to do is you need to take what you're writing, but you've got to actually be more assertive, uh, take down the barriers between the reader and the writer, use simpler words. Uh, don't use words with Latin or, or uh, French roots, use Anglo-Saxon words. Um, use simple short sentences. Uh, and you know, keep trying to tie things into concrete examples. So you know, don't have a whole lot of abstracts there. Have some concrete example which exemplifies that abstract but which people can, can relate to. Uh, up on the website you'll find uh, a link to an essay by George Orwell uh, called Politics in the English Language. Uh, it's really more about writing op-ed pieces than anything else and the advice that he gives there is just fantastic for anyone wanting to write this sort of material. And can I ask, um, in your work life, I imagine it's exactly the same as in most people's, that you have to write for a number of different audiences throughout your working day or throughout the working week, and you're constantly changing styles and approaches to writing. What are, do you use any techniques in your own writing that allows you to change gears? Um, no, I think, I mean, writing's an art. It's like playing music. I think you're getting in a... You get an inner voice that says, yes, that will work, uh, or no, that won't. Uh, I mean, if I was writing a report for someone, then I'd use more of the academic uh, passive sentence structure, maybe longer, use specific words. Uh, if I'm writing an opinion piece, um, I'm, uh, I'm inclined to put questions in there uh, addressed to the reader to try and engage them. So if there's complexity, you say, bang, 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 bang. Uh, so you think that this. Uh, and then you whip them around and say, well, actually, that doesn't happen for these reasons. Uh, so it's how you get the complexity and, and, and not lose them. Uh, but, I, you know, it's something you've got to work uh, at, and it's something I think you, you gather by reading mm -hmm. material by people. You know, no, no one ever became a good writer without reading other people's material uh, and getting some feel for what they're, they're trying to do. Uh, writing is an intensely individual thing, but one technique I tend to use is to imagine yourself in the context of who you're writing for. You know, if, if, you're writing, um, if you're writing a throwaway comedy piece, you can imagine yourself sitting around the barbecue, you know, chatting to mates. If, if you're trying to write something that's more intensely academic, you imagine you're talking to your head of department or professor. If you um, if you want to write something that's an op-ed, that you imagine yourself in a forum full of people where you're all sitting around in chairs and trying to persuade them. So you need to be economical, you need to be to the point, but you have an awareness of who the people are around you and who you're speaking to. And that's just a little visual technique, visualisation technique that I try to use. Um, but it's different things work for different people. Yeah. And revise, revise, revise. Right. Graham, you've mentioned you need to read to be a good writer. Yeah. Can I ask the two of you, um, what do you read in this genre? What in the opinion page mm. genre? Well, I read three newspapers a day, essentially read the Courier Mail to find out what's happening in my local town and check the op-eds out there. Generally, I don't read them too thoroughly. Um, I guess the ones I read thoroughly are the Australian and the Financial Review. Uh, and I also read pretty widely on the net. Uh, I think out of the stuff I read on the net, most consistently good op-ed stuff's on Slate, which is the Microsoft journal, but they have some fantastic writers about American politics um, and uh, it's a conversational tone that they use. Um, lots of sort of tricks to keep people engaged, uh, but yeah, it's great stuff. And then there's other stuff like Atlantic Monthly. They do a longer, more intellectual style piece. You can get most of their stuff on the net going back for a number of years. Um, but um, yeah, they're probably my main sources. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, I read the SMH and the Age and the Oz Critter, the op ed specifically, and most of the rest of it if I get a chance, which doesn't happen very often. Um, Slate's wonderful as an example of the sort of writing we're talking about. Um, I'm a big fan of feature journalism, um, for that reason, not so much the tabloid feature type stuff, but um, some of, you know, Time, those sorts of magazines have some really interesting stuff in them. Mm -hmm. um, and I also like, again, read widely on the web, um, 
try and get some of the English. There's a, a site called Open Democracy that, that does a lot of toing and froing um, in terms of argument and discussion. Um, I, I find some of the, um, if you want something a little different, some of the Indian and Asian and to some extent the African journals that are trying to do the same thing we are have some slightly different ways of expressing things that are useful and occasionally you read something there and you go, well, that's a new way of saying things. Mm -hmm. and that's just a, just cultural diversity at that point. Um, but yeah, big, big fan of the current affairs journals type thing. Marie Claire is not bad. And there are several others. But yeah. they're not cheap. So if I could ask, what would be the kind of the best advice you'd give to budding writers of policy or political commentary? Uh, know what you're talking about, understand the people that you're trying to talk to, get to the point quickly, get them on the edge of their seats and finish before you lose them. Mm -hmm. you always, always know more than you're prepared to say. Don't, don't try to go out on a limb, don't try to wow people and blow them away, just be consistently direct to the point and know who you're talking to and what say. Okay. There's one other question I'd like to ask you. Um, occasionally, uh, it's necessary to write collaboratively. Um, I was wondering if you had any views on the difficulties of writing. Uh, Very difficult to write well collaboratively. Mm. You're probably best off delegating someone to do the writing, but having a number of other people doing the research. Um, so if you've got one main writer, and you can get a group of people who are all involved in it sitting down while the writer does the writing, um, on the basis of sort of agreed upon an argument to start with, and then they can sort of butt in and say, well, wait a bit, uh, I think you're getting that point wrong, can you fix that up or whatever. I mean, I've written a few things collaboratively, uh, but it's always really boiled down to someone being the, the person who's actually putting it all together. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you'll end up with a disaster on your hands stylistically uh, if you try and have too many people doing it, or if you say, well, you can do this paragraph and I'll do that paragraph, or whatever, you know, it's just not going to work. And don't take anything personally. Um, be prepared to read everything that everybody else says. Be prepared to you know, take on board what they've got to say. But don't, don't take the criticism personally. It's a group project. You know, it's all got to work together as a team. Try and, try and know more about the team than you need to, about the people that are involved and where they're likely to be coming from. Um, that's just good human relations, really. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, don't take it personally. And, and what's the uh, the best way to solicit feedback from an editor? Gently. Yeah, don't. don't. <laughs> we've, we've got some very high maintenance people that send us material and demand that we publish, and that's the sure way going to the bottom of the pile because you've got so many things to do during the day. The last thing you want is someone tugging on the sleeve all the time saying, hey, what about me? Hey, what about me? Uh, so, unfortunately, you probably won't get as much feedback as you like from an editor. Uh, that's not because the editor's not interested, it's just because they've got so many time pressures. Uh, so if you get any feedback at all, you're doing quite well. Uh, and uh, if they're consistently knocking you back, then it's really probably up to you to research by reading what they are publishing and try to work out what it is they're really after and why it is you're not giving it to them. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want feedback, be as specific as possible. If, if there's some particular thing you think might not have been up to scratch, ask about it directly. Um, be prepared to you know, receive phone calls as in response to an email, things like that. Make yourself as open and approachable as possible. If it's, if it's just a quick question about something, send someone an email, ask the question and, and include a phone number. You know, just because it's new technology doesn't mean it has to be used. Um, you know, and the phone is often the best way to ring someone up and say, hey, you know, this, was the, this is what I'm not happy with about it, can you fix that up and send it back to me and if I get it in an hour then it'll get read because it's still fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. If it's fire off an email three days later, they check their Yahoo or Hotmail account, and two days after that it comes back, well, it's probably gone. Okay. And uh, one of the things I've learned from interviewing people throughout the years is a good question to ask at the end is, is there a question I should have asked? Of uh -huh. <laughs> um, I don't think so. Yeah. No, I think we've pretty well covered everything. Okay. Uh, 